Well, welcome to Family Matters, everyone, for tonight. Today we have Doug and Cindy Mogg with us. They're all the way from Newcastle in Australia, just returned from the mountains where they've been on holiday. Um, they're going to be talking tonight about a really intriguing topic, what to do when you really mess up. And, you know, Doug and I have both just recently been doing quite a bit of home renovations. So this is going to be really exciting for me because as a DIY home renovation of person, you do tend to really muck up every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> did you, I'm sure you did once in a while, did you, Doug? Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. But we're actually talking about messing up in our relationships, oh. not in our paintwork. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> well, with that, what we'll do is we'll just start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can all be together now. We thank you for this technology that we can share with each other and for the experience and the wisdom of Doug and Cindy tonight. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that when we do sin and when we do stuff up and really mess up, we thank you that there is forgiveness. And we pray that you would help each one of us to develop a, a humble and forgiving heart toward each other. We pray for your blessing on our marriages and on our families that you would strengthen them and grow them. Help us to be people that you want us to be, to be clear examples of your family. We thank you for this opportunity and pray for your blessing on our night together. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So tonight we have uh, what to do when you really mess up. And it's going to be really a discussion about, about repentance, confession, apology and forgiveness as it relates to, to marriage and families. Um, so Doug and Cindy have got about oh, well over 50 years of marriage experience to share with us. They've also... They've also been really involved in um, sharing their wisdom of in marriage, um, doing doing marriage classes and marriage enrichment courses, and that sort of thing over the years. And have done many many um, seminars and that sort of thing over over time. Um, so we're really looking forward to talking to you tonight. So can I ask? No, I'm going to do a couple of just a quick Bible reading. And this one comes from, I've got three here. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, which says this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. Another one in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 to 32, says this. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. And this one, for women to have a glorious vote over, is in Ephesians chapter 7, verse 20, where it says, There is not a righteous man on earth, who does what is right and never sins. So there you go. Even we men stuff up. <laughs> Even we men make mistakes. And the Bible says so. Spot on, so, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so why did you choose this topic? I'm going to start with the first question. Sorry, sorry, Doug, I'm going to steal your thunder. Why did you choose this topic? <laughs> Why did we choose this topic, darling? Because real life involves real people who make real mistakes, so the need for apology impacts every one of us. There, we're all in it. We're all in it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, we, actually, uh, we actually have read and used the, um, the book Five Languages of Apology, and most of what we're giving tonight is, is taken out of it 
uh, it's it's um, it, it's really worthwhile. Um, we hope you hope you uh, you get something out of it. Yeah, we'll put that uh, link up on the chat screen later on if people right. want to look. look. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So carry on. Carry on. <laughs> we go. Let's. I want you to go back in your minds just now and think of all the wonderful things that you loved about the person you chose to marry. Concentrate how awesome they were, and how much you loved them. And you can share just one of those things if you're near that person. Just one. Just okay. one. <laughs> okay the reality of life is that this is also the person you may have hurt or failed in some way or many ways in the past or just quite recently or even today so sometimes we hurt the people we love yeah um so it's important to uh to know what to do when we really mess up, isn't it? It is. Yeah. The person you love most and have committed your life to is an imperfect being, just as you are. We can expect failures to come from the best people in our lives, because just as was just read to us from Ecclesiastes, there isn't a righteous human on earth who does what is right and never sins. Not just men, Rob, human. Uh, <laughs> all of us, yes. I would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> real, life of real people who make real mistakes. So uh, what what type of, I, I'm sort of like the, um, I'm like the uh, straight man here in this, this discussion. What type of failures are we talking about? Well, there's no shortage of areas in, in what we can really mess up in. We can have angry outbursts and be impatient and lose our self-control and be quite critical or judgmental. There can be out of control spending at sales. There can be deception and lying and name calling, belittling and selfishness. And I could go on and on to jealousy and conceit and greed. And, and of course, all these failures just appear after you get married. No, 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 no. <laughs> There's some common areas where normal people find they have brokenness from the past or some immaturity where they're not equipped to perform just like their spouse would like them to or in the best way possible. For example, they might have a disability to get close or to communicate well or to sustain intimacy. They might definitely find quite early on that they have parenting abilities that need some help, or they may have emotional problems from the past or from their family of origin, or they may have lived always with a lack of structure and no self-discipline because somebody else was always disciplining them and no follow through because somebody picked up the pieces. Maybe they have financial inabilities to make or to manage money. Maybe they have sexual difficulties from fear, from past trauma or from shame or emotional factors. Maybe they just haven't grown up and completely left home and become adult and ready for marriage. Wow. Well, none of those seem to me to be actual sins. They're just areas um, in which we need to grow. But they certainly cause conflict to arise, don't they, in, a, in relationships? They could possibly, that's true. And some of them we may need help with, mentoring and supporting and teaching. Well, how, how might that actually happen? Well, for some of those, there would be therapy perhaps with a trained psychologist or financial counselling for the people who can't manage money or there may be support groups or recovery groups that they could join or just somebody to keep them accountable who will help. 
we definitely need to devote resources, time and energy to these problems. But practically, uh, it seems to me that uh, whatever the problem is, as a couple, we should be prepared to help each other mm. through it. Yep. We need to be conscious of our spouse's feelings. I use the word spouse, I don't like it, <laughs> but it's, it's easiest, okay? Um, one of you doesn't need to win while the other loses. Uh, mm. In fact, by supporting each other, through areas in which we need to change and grow. It means it's win-win. We can we can both be winners. So is there yes. always a win-win situation? Sorry? Is it always possible to find a win-win situation? Probably not on your list of questions, sorry. <laughs> Probably not immediately, no. no. And sometimes there's a compromise that has to happen for both of you or one of you. But if you have empathy and understanding and are non-defensive, um, a lot of things can, can be resolved. I think you know, Robert, if, um, if she's feeling better about it all, then you're feeling better about it all. Absolutely. You know, yeah, it's win-win. That's win-win. That's for sure. Yeah. All right. Um, so, what can we do when our spouse fails us in some way, or it is is less than we would wish them to be? Well, I think there's a few choices there. We can deny there's any problem, bottle it all up and lock it away. <clears throat> One of those rooms in our head, nothing's wrong here. That doesn't always all go well for the future. Or we can beat the person up for their imperfections. <laughs> You'd be trying hard. <laughs> or we can love them out of it. So just like Peter says, love covers a multitude of sins. And as we know, there's no failure in God's eyes that's larger than his grace. And he asks us to try to be like that. And nothing in a relationship has to permanently destroy that relationship if forgiveness is in the picture. No hurt exists that love cannot heal. I've, um, I've got this quote from... Uh from the message translation from Colossians 3. I love it and I think it's worth sharing. Um, the apostle says, so chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline. Be even tempered content with second place, quick to forgive an offence. Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic all-purpose garment. Never be without it. That's a really neat translation. Yeah, I love yeah. it. It, it sort of picks up um, the the whole idea of uh, of wearing it, of of putting those characteristics on, and putting it on them. completely, covering yeah. yourself in love. Yeah, yeah. yeah. which is yeah. which is really important in a marriage situation or even a family situation. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Good news. Yep. Well, some good news is that when somebody has messed up, and we've just realize that we all do we can learn the art of apology we can learn how to make things better and the book we read and this course is looking at those five languages of apology and number one language is expressing regret expressing regret 
Well, does that mean saying, I'm sorry? Yeah. yeah. That's the emotional aspect of an apology. It's a, an expression that you own a sense of guilt or shame or pain that your behaviour has hurt someone else. Maybe it's the disappointment you've caused or the inconvenience or the betrayal of trust. So regret focuses on being sorry for what I did or for what I failed to do that affected another person. Yeah, mainly especially you. me. Especially <laughs> you. <laughs> and the first thing about an apology is it must be sincere. I remember when our kids were little, we'd say, tell your brother you're sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Say it like you mean it. <laughs> Meaning you weren't sincere, but you know. And the other thing about an apology is it has much more impact if it's specific. I have to tell you this story. Um, most of you know I was a, a school deputy principal and principal for a long time. And deputy principals tend to shout a lot. Um, to get attention, they raise their voice. And uh, the trouble is, sometimes I tried it at home. Um, I, I, would, I would shout. Well, I didn't think I was shouting. And Cindy would say, stop shouting at me. And I'd say, I'm not shouting. <laughs> and um, I, I would go away and, and think about it. Um, fortunately, she would quietly say to me, well, when you raise your voice like that, it, it scares me you make me afraid so uh, I would come back to her and and rather than just say well I'm sorry I could say I'm sorry I raised my voice to you I know mm -hmm. now that that makes you afraid that, 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 how would that go that would be very good <laughs> You don't do it now. <laughs> that oh, would I've, be. Lost, I've lost <laughs> deputy principal boys. Another thing about an apology is that we have to avoid using the word but. For example. Well, um, so I'm sorry I yelled at you, but what you did was stupid. And verbally shift the blame from to the other person we've moved from apology to attack and attack never leads to forgiveness and reconciliation well um so is is saying sorry enough then well for many people it's definitely not enough they need to hear the person who hurt them is accepting responsibility for what they've done so does that actually mean uh, saying I was wrong? I know Fonzie had trouble with that. <laughs> um, I made a mistake. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's true. My dad used to say, all of us make mistakes. The only mistake that will destroy you is the one you're unwilling to admit. I think yeah. it's useful to look at some some statements that show accepting responsibility uh let's try what i did was selfish and wrong or perhaps i didn't think before i acted i did the wrong thing then how about i spoke harshly and said unkind things in anger it was unloving or I know we've discussed this before and I've done it again and it's truly my fault. I did it again. So if, if we apologise and then accept responsibility when we mess things up, surely that would be enough, wouldn't it? Well, it's a start. Only a start. <laughs> 
and they don't have to be in order. Okay. The, the third language of apology is making restitution. Restitution. I'm thinking of um, world wars and countries. Restitution means um, trying to make up for the damage that you've done. So uh, I, I could actually ask you, what what can I do to make it right? Well, sometimes you can't make it right, but you can make it better than it was when you did that thing that was wrong. So yeah, that would be a good start to ask that question. The feeling of making things right seems to be embedded in our human psyche. It's in our judicial system and it's in human relationships. We're, we're deeply affected by that fundamental idea. We want to make it right again. In close relationships, our desire for restitution is almost always um, based on our need for love. The question that lingers in our minds is, how could they love me and do that to me? So what we're saying is that for some people, the words, I'm sorry, and I was wrong, may not be enough. Because deep down, the question they want answered is, do you, do you still love me? Yes, I think the heart of restitution is reassuring the family member that you genuinely still love them. And it's, it's very important to express that in one of their own love languages. The love languages are affirming words, acts of service, quality uninterrupted time, physical touch or gift giving. We haven't got enough time tonight to go into detail on all of those because we're trying to do the languages of apology. There's a there's an opportunity to jump in, Robert. <laughs> you can jump in there. <laughs> Carry on. Um, yeah, that's so uh, that books that those come from uh, Gary Chapman's book. Yes. Uh, Five yeah. love languages. Yeah, uh, that's just it. about to get a copy waved in front of us. This <laughs> one. Five love languages, yeah, uh, which is a really helpful tool in in building relationships when you're speaking a different la love language to to the other person. Exactly, yeah. Um, maybe in the future there's an opportunity for a session on on the love languages. Absolutely, yeah. As well as trying to make things better by using the love languages to reassure people, restitution often needs more than that. It extends beyond just doing that, expressing love. It may require a repayment or a restoring of something. For example, if somebody's broken or damaged something that is yours, they've scratched your watch or they've damaged your car or even damaged your good name in some way by, by putting you down in public. Uh, there has to be some positive repayment. I, the first story I thought of in the Bible that showed this was Zacchaeus, the tax collector. And when he was challenged, he promised to repay four times as much as he had taken. He was really into restitution and repayment. Jesus saw this as a sign of his genuine confession and he even held Zacchaeus up as an example of how to deal with past failures. Uh, I think that's a lovely example. Well, uh, so far we've talked about apology, how to say sorry. Mm -hmm. We've talked about uh, uh, responsibility, taking responsibility, uh, owning the behaviour, and now how to make things better, restitution. Uh, could there be anything else perhaps? Yeah. There's <laughs> more. <laughs>
Wait, there's more. There's <laughs> genuine <laughs> repentance. Genuine repentance. Okay. One one of my friends said, we always have the same old arguments, my husband and I, about the same old things, but I suppose that's true of most couples. It's the repetition of the offending action that upsets me most, she said. He promises not to do it again and then he does it. I don't want apologies. I want him not to do the thing that bothers me ever again. Mm. So um, speaking the language of repentance uh, begins with some sort of expression of your intent to change, yeah. to change your ways. Uh, all, I reckon all true repentance begins in here, in your heart. Uh, so we recognise what we've done wrong that our actions have hurt the one that we love and we don't want to continue that behaviour because we love them so much. Um, so we decide with God's help that we're determined to change. Then we're ready to verbalise this decision to the person we have offended. And I reckon it's perfectly fine to tell the person that you hope they'll be really patient with you. Of course, none of us can be 100% improved in a moment. It's going yeah. to take some time. But just hearing about an intention to try to change is so positive for the person who's been upset by the action over and over. Well, the step that follows on from that in the road of repentance is developing a, a plan for implementing change. Doesn't have to be complex, I guess, or elaborate, but I think it has to be specific. One family we know, if the husband feels himself getting really angry with the children, he goes to his wife and, and says, I'm getting heated, will you please take over for a little while? And he takes a walk around the block and comes back and offers to help her do anything that needs doing just now. It's, it's so ideal when a couple can help each other work out a plan to correct the behaviour that's troublesome. He comes back much calmer and that the relationship is maintained. I reckon, um, and it, it certainly works for me, that the step that follows that is is writing it down. I mean, some people are writing downers, but others are. Um, but for me, it makes it concrete and makes it specific. So rather than just a general, I'll try not to blame her for my negative emotions, it could be something as as specific as I will start my sentences with I rather than you. Um, for example, um, I feel angry when that happens, not you make me feel angry. So are you talking here, Doug, about writing things down for yourself? Or writing things down as as a like a, a sorry card for for Cindy. Uh, <laughs> writing it down for myself. Yourself, yeah. yeah. Writing it down for myself as a reminder that this is this is the intent. Mm. This is my intent. Yeah. And it does help. I know. I've I've done that myself. And it certainly makes a big difference. And some people use post-it notes, you know, post it on their mirror. So the first thing they see is a little reminder that just works for them. Um, it's the reminder for the day. Yeah. You know, start by. Um, don't use but. No buts. <laughs> and 
in our efforts to change, to repent, turn right around and, and behave better, we, we, we will mess up again. It's not going to be 100% immediately, but the quicker you admit that that's happened, the quicker you can try again. So admitting wrong is not just to your partner or your family member, it's also admitting to God that you need his help. And it's humbling and we must be honest about it, but it certainly gives opportunity to build a closer relationship. Mm. Perhaps some statements of genuine repentance give us the idea. Okay, here I go. <laughs> I know my behaviour was painful, was painful to you. I don't ever want to do that again. I'm open to any ideas that you might have how I might change my behaviour. Well, how was that? That was really good. <laughs> I'll give you <laughs> later. <laughs> I know sometimes I sound critical to you and I wonder if you could help me, how could I say it in a different way that wouldn't hurt your feelings and come across like so critical? See me later. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, how's this? What What would you like to see me change? that would make things better for you. Mm. I could think of a few things, but they don't need to know. Okay. <laughs> would you, how about this? Would you be willing to remind me if I revert to my old behaviours? How about you say relapse? I think that will help me stop and think about how I'm going. Well, if that was um, what we agreed to do, um, I'm happy to do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, the book says five. <laughs> so there's got to be another one. So we're up to the last, the fifth language of apology, which is requesting forgiveness. And that, that to a lot of people indicates very clearly that you want the relationship restored. You want it to be as good as it can be. It also shows you've done something wrong. It, it, um, it seems to me that most of us have trouble with this asking to be forgiven. It's a very uh, humbling experience. It is. And, and you know, uh, I look back at my my family uh, being brought up. I look back at my ecclesial life and for the life of me, I can't recall anyone asking someone else to be forgiven. Now, I wonder why it is so hard. What, what is it that we're afraid of? Probably most of the time we don't realise we've done something wrong or we don't feel we've done something wrong. Um, no, well, yeah. Yeah, that, that's yes. very true. Yeah, yeah. I think there are some fears tied up with it. I think for people who like being in control, they feel really uncomfortable of when they think they're going to lose control. And asking someone to forgive you means you relinquish control for that moment and you put the future of the relationship in someone else's hands. And that could be very difficult for the people who love power, who love to be in control of everything. Perhaps too, if you ask somebody to forgive you, there's that terrible fear of rejection. They might say, no, I can't yet. And then you feel, well, I'm not enough. I'm, I'm, I'm just not. That's my greatest fear that I won't be enough. I'm rejected as I am. Or maybe it's that you don't want to be a failure. You fear failing, and to admit you're wrong, 
you feel like you failed as a person or you failed your moral beliefs. And admitting wrong is equivalent to say, oh, I'm just a failure. Well, on the other hand, you know, um, I guess sometimes it's hard to, to forgive. Uh, it is hard sometimes for people to forgive. Thank, thank the Lord that that um, forgiveness is the at the basis of our relationship with Him, um, and that He does forgive. What could be some reasons for why it's hard to forgive? Well, like we said a little bit earlier, our judicial system wants us to have things even. You did wrong, you'll get punished. And we have to, to forgive somebody, we have to give up that desire to retaliate in some way, to make, to try to make the hurt even. If he hurt me, I'll hurt them. That's the opposite to forgiving. And that's very hard. I think that's one of the hard things about forgiveness. And some things that we're being asked to forgive have very long consequences. They're long lasting effects and it, they can be physical effects. You might have been physically hurt or verbally damaged or even sexually abused in the past. And that, even though forgiven, still impacts you and makes it hard for you to totally forgive. Or maybe the the offence is being repeated over and over, and it's like put downs every day or something like that. It's very difficult then to forgive that because it's like the lady, my friend, said. It's it happens over again and again. Mm. Well, uh, I guess then for some people in those sorts of circumstances. Forgiveness becomes a, an ongoing process. They, they may need to ask God's help so that they can forgive every day. Yeah. And having a forgiving spirit. Yes. 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 And it often doesn't make the pain go away, but it, it is the right thing to do. We're asked to, it's a decision to forgive. Are you going to pull it all together now, do you think? I don't know. <laughs> it's helpful to understand that people have different languages of apology and need to hear things differently or some more about it. But they, it's, it's not a prescription. It's not like getting a medicine and this will solve everything. They don't all need to be used at once in any particular order or at any one time. But recognising your own primary apology language is really helpful and recognising your partners or talking about it. So I just thought we'd have a, three questions to help you realise what your apology language may be. So we're going to, Rob, it, it, we're going to open it up to, to everybody. I mean, not everybody will have their spouse with them, but um, everyone can think about these questions and see what it is um, in themselves that they, they, they need uh, for uh, an apology to be uh, meaningful for them. There's only okay. three questions, and I'll just leave a little bit of time between them. When I am hurt, what do I expect the person to do or to say? I'm just putting them up in the chat box as well. So if anyone wants to see them, what do I expect the person to do or to say? The second one is, what hurts most deeply about this situation? That's the situation where you, you've been hurt. Mm. And uh, what hurts the most? 
what hurts the most when? When a person apologises? No. No. No, what's hurt you most what about it? What hurts you the most about... Okay. Like and the volume. Not mods. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> You're well, better than me, Robert. <laughs> Now, sometimes you can work out what matters the most to you by recognising what language is most important when I apologise to someone else. What do I actually say? That what is most, what language is most important when I apologise? So, when we're talking languages, let's just just going back a, a step. The languages are expressing regret, accepting responsibility making restitution, genuine repentance, and requesting forgiveness. Is that right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So for me, mine would be perhaps accepting responsibility. So I would be going, you know, if I was going to apologise, I would go, oh, sorry, that's my fault. Yeah. Yeah. Be, yeah. Okay. But um, what would yours be? I don't know. I feel, yeah. like, I feel like you kind of need them all, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> She's one of those, Robert. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's quite understandable. Yes, because yeah. yours was not specific. That's my fault. What was your fault? So, yeah, Sharon yeah. wants you to be specific. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and the third question. That was the, um, what language is most important when I apologise? That was the third. Okay. One, one of the things that we thought uh, would be worthwhile talking about uh, on the topic was how we go about teaching our children to apologize. Uh, yeah, that's a great Cindy's, idea. Yeah, yeah, Cindy's got some ideas. And I thought back to my childhood too, and I don't remember seeing, I mean, I was told to say sorry to my brother and he was told to say sorry to me, but I didn't see apology modeled in any of the forms we've talked about really. Um, and we model everything else. We model how to use you know, cutlery and how to say, you know, pardon me and all those things. <clears throat> but I think if we model what we're doing to our children, they will learn. Um, they will learn that they must accept responsibility for their own actions. That's number one important thing that children need to know. And of course, the second important thing is they have to realise that their effect, actions really do affect other people. You might have to point that out when they're very little. What you did you know, hurt their feelings, or if you, you know, pull their hair, that really hurts. They have to accept that what it's what they've done that affects others. And the third thing that they must learn is that there's always going to be rules in our life. There's rules at home, there's rules on the road, there's rules everywhere we go at work. It doesn't matter where you go, there are rules. And that is to keep you safe, to keep others safe. And it's part of learning that if you break the rule, then some of these apologies have to happen. And a wonderful thing to teach children and to model is that, and to talk about is that apologies will restore friendships and family relationships. Um, if you honestly say you're sorry, most people say, oh, forget it, it doesn't matter now. Oh, you know, I was hurt on the day, but it's okay. And they go on as friends, not as enemies, or in, in you know, the worst case scenario, not speaking again, the big silent treatment. So I think, if children see you apologise and hear you, then they will learn them quickly. That's the big thing, isn't it? Sort of modelling it mm. 
um, so that they learn. Uh, mm. Actions speak louder than words. Mm. Well, thank you very much. Both of you. Yeah, that, the, uh, that probably finishes us, Robert. Finishes you? Can, yep. We can open it up. <laughs> yep, we'll do so in a minute. Um, so thank you both very much for coming, for, for sharing that with us. Um, it's it's such an important topic because I know, well, we don't struggle a huge amount with that, but but when we struggle, we struggle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you mess up and and you know, like we we you know, we're both hedgehogs. So we curl up in a little prickly ball each. And we and, just feel sorry for ourselves. Yeah, yeah, and, <laughs> and we have a cold war. Uh, um, and so, yeah, it's just one of those things that, you know, like you say, it's really, really hard to apologise. And having a few practical pointers, like those five, um, those five languages of, of um, apology, apology um, is really, really helpful. You know, because we can pick on one and go, yeah, okay, you know, I, I'm sorry because, or I'm I'm specifically sorry because, um, and I'm genuinely sorry, and I won't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> and can you help me not to do it again, you know? So, yeah, no, that's really great. So thank you so much for that. Pleasure. What we'll do now is we'll, we'll close the this, this part of our session. Um, Next week, for those of you who are tuning in next week, we have next Monday, 7.30, same time, same place, we have Ron and Catherine Hoban speaking about twisting the cube, changing the paradigm. Very intriguing topic, but uh, Ron and Catherine are going to be talking about a uh, specific incident that's, that's happened through their life where they really struggled for quite a while um, and some really powerful lessons and and growth stories that have come out of that so we're really looking forward to to talking to them next week um now also if anyone hasn't filled in that questionnaire that we've got online please do that that would be really helpful to us we've had a few replies which has been really helpful but um if you've got some more please um please fill that in and i'll put the link up shortly as well for that um, and if you want to get Family Matters reminders to find out what's coming up, um, just email me, robert at thinkythings.com, and I'll send those to you as well. Um, and also I'll put up a link for past recordings as well if you want to hear those. So we'll just get uh, Doug now, if you wouldn't mind, Doug, would you close with prayer for us? Sure. Thank you. He Heavenly Father, we... We approach you with great thankfulness, knowing that you are a God of mercy and, and grace. And we, we thank you that you are a forgiving God. Help us to realize that our relationship with you depends upon your forgiveness and mercy to us. And help us in our in our relationships, our marriage, our our families to to exhibit that wondrous forgiveness to each other, so that we might be reconciled to each other as, as we have been reconciled to you through our Lord Jesus. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss and to learn together. We praise you and we give you our thanks in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.